Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing well? It's good to see you guys. And if you're in the foyer, you guys can come on in and join us. And the rest of you guys can stand. And then Mariah's going to open us up with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everyone here. I pray right now that you will just fill us with your presence. I pray that we will just worship you in spirit and in truth. And I just thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you that we can be here this morning. Thank you so much for everyone here that we can be family, and brothers and sisters in Christ, just worshiping you, God, and giving you all the glory that you deserve. And we just pray right now that you'll free us from any distractions, anything that keeps us from you, God, that we will humble ourselves before you, God, and that you'll just speak to us during this time, that you can, that you'll search our hearts, God, see if there's anything we're anxious about, anything that we're worried about, any wicked way within us, God, and help us to just get right with you in this time, and I pray that we will just praise you and thank you for all that you've given us and all that you've done for us. We ask your presence to just fill this place right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.
again on the third day and you freed us or if, if we're in you we're free God we just thank you so much for that freedom Lord I pray God that out of the love that you poured out for us Lord that we would understand that and out of love Lord we would give our lives to you God so just sing just amazing grace again and just just try to understand just the weight of what he did for you of how much he freed you of where he pulled you from of how much he opened up your eyes how much he found you. We just thank you, God, so much. Sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I saved the rich like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blood, but now I see. Say again. 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Oh, now you stay. 
stand with arms high and high abandoned in all of the world who gave it all. Yes, I'll stand. My soul up to you, surrender all I am is yours. But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Surrender it all to him right now. How you guys doing now that you guys got to praise the Lord? Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. So if you guys would turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And how many of you guys are enjoying Ephesians? You guys are like, when's the last time we spoke on Ephesians? <laughs> I, I think our la the last time I spoke on Ephesians was last year, actually, which is only two months ago. But but it was last year, and so we had, I think before that, I had two other topical ones. So we talked about um, bringing everything and bringing it before the Lord, doing everything, all our work, as unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. And then we talked about 2020 vision. You guys remember that? Talking about how there's so many different vision problems, and we we're talking about it more spiritually, right? And so we need to allow the Holy Spirit to check our vision. So I was considering all this. I was like, wow, we haven't talked about Ephesians in a while. So I want to get you warmed up again for Ephesians. So in a nutshell, Ephesians is where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story. And then he shows how it should reshape every part of our story, right? Every part of our life. Amen? So... And we kind of jumped in in the middle of it because chapters 1 through 3 really lays down the fundamentals, really lays down the gospel for us. And then chapters 4 through 6, which we are studying, that really shows how to apply it, right? We talked a lot about walking it out, right? And it's really important to walk it out because we can have all this knowledge, but if we don't put it into practice, it's worthless. So... You guys excited for today? We're going to talk about spiritual warfare. It's pretty, you know, I, Mariah was just talking to me in the prayer room about that. She was saying how, especially when you're speaking on spiritual warfare or speaking against the enemy, he's going to want to attack. So why don't we pray right now so that we can just hear the word of God and be able to apply it to our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be here as a family. We get to be here unified in Christ. And, and that's what you're talking about in Ephesians, that you want us to be unified, God, as the body of Christ. And I just pray that as we talk about spiritual warfare, as we talk about, as we touch on the full armor of God a little bit, I pray that we would understand how to use these things, how to use the um, the equipment that you've given us, God. 
And I just thank you right now for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you have given us your Holy Spirit so that as we study your word, it's not just text. It's not just words, but it's alive and active. And so I pray, Father, that we would be able to um, take it all in. I pray that you prepare our hearts right now. If our hearts are hardened or just closed off to you or if our attitude is in the wrong place, God, please soften us up so that we can be able to take in everything that you have for us this morning. And I know you have so much for your people, and I don't want your people to miss it, and I don't want to miss it either. So I pray, God, that you would just give us your mind, that we would be able to um, rightly divide your scripture. And we know that, you know, I can't interpret the Bible perfectly, but we know that your Holy Spirit can speak to us, God. I was just talking about the fish and the loaves. I can just bring the fish, but you can multiply it, God. You can make it great. You can really allow it to speak to people. And so I pray that that's what would happen this morning, and just by your grace and your mercy. And we love you, Father, and we glorify you, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, so, yeah, if you haven't turned there already, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And the title of today's message is, You Must Stand. Would you guys say that with me? You must stand. All right, everyone stand. I'm just kidding. You guys can stay seated. But, yeah, let's look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Amen? Amen. And you guys know what comes next, right? The full armor of God. It it mentions it here, but then it lists it, and we're going to be able to study that in future messages. So come back (laughs) so that we can study that together. But... If you look at this, Paul is closing out the letter of Ephesians by reminding them the reality of spiritual evil. And a lot of people aren't reminded of that anymore, are they? We try to put it off. We try to ignore it, but we can't. And Paul is clearly saying that because there's beings, there's forces that are trying to undermine the unity of God's people. They're they're trying to compromise your relationship with Christ. And Paul is aware of this evil. So in response, what does he say? He challenges us to stand firm and to put on the whole armor of God. So it's cool because this metaphorical set of body armor, it comes from Isaiah. So he's drawing it from there. And we'll look at, at that in the future. But let's look at verse 10 again. Let's start with that. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So throughout Ephesians, Paul carefully established our place in Jesus, right? He explained the fundamentals to us of the Christian walk. And now he says, finally, it kind of reminds me of the word therefore, you know, it's saying, so in light of all these things, in light of all that God has done for us and all that I've explained to you, you know, Paul, we must know that there's a battle to fight, right? And many preachers nowadays leave this part out. They say everything's great, everything's dandy, everything's fine. And some so-called Christians, they say they don't even believe in a literal hell. Have you ever heard that? Some people say that? Or they think that maybe hell is just a short time and then you get to go to heaven. But people are dismissing all these different things. And they're dismissing um, the demonic as well, saying... I understand that people can take it too far and say everything's demonic, everything's the devil, and we shouldn't be like that, but we got to understand that the devil is attacking us, and we need to be able to stand against that. Amen? Amen. So, it's dangerous if we think that 
you know, people can't be oppressed in the church, you know. And I'm not saying possessed, but, you know, oppressed. So it's dangerous to think that way. And that's why Paul's urging us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Amen? Amen. So it's cool. First Samuel 30, verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the, all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But this is where he gets the strengthening part, I believe. It says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Amen. We need to learn that, right? Amen. Don't miss that. Strengthening yourself in the Lord is such an important part of the spiritual battle. Because if you're not strong, you're not going to be able to fight. You're just going to be run over by the devil. So we're in the physical realm, right? So it's easier for us to think about the physical realm. So think about that. If you are weak, if you can barely stand, are you going to put on this heavy body armor? No, right? You're not, you're not going to be able to use the armor. So you think about that. It's going to burden you down. It's going to make you an ineffective soldier. So first, you need to be strengthened in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And one, one uh, pastor said that before a soldier is given a gun or shown how to fire a missile or something, what does he go through? Training. training. Basic training. Yes. And what is that? What's the major purpose of that? It's to build up strength, Right. I mean, physically, but also mentally, right? So they, they're basically saying, soldier, we're giving you the best weapons, the best armor, so that you can be able to... But first, we've got to strengthen you so that you'll be able to use these things, right? So you understand where I'm going with that? So I like the word might because it's described as inherent power or force. So think of a you know, big muscular man walking down, I don't know, in the store or something, and you see his muscles. So he's not actually using his muscles that, that greatly, right? He's just walking. But you can tell that he has that power. He has that reserve of power or the reserve of strength. And then strength here that we're talking about is the exercise of might. So I was at Costco, and there's this you know, short, stocky little guy, and he had a shirt that said, For Fitty. It didn't say 450, it said 450 for some reason, but it meant, I believe it meant, because it looked like a bench shirt, it looked like he could bench 450 pounds, and so, you know, I was like, yeah, he probably can, but I didn't really see that, he's just pushing around a cart, right? I was thinking, wow, 450, that's only 25 pounds more than me, I was like, wow, that's crazy, I was like, no, I can't bench, (laughs) some of you guys are like, what? No, it's more like 125 or something. But, <clears throat> but that's, he can put that strength in, in, he can use that might, that reserve of strength. And so when he's actually benching 450, that's when he's actually using his strength, right? So that's, that's what we need to do. We need to stay connected to God so that we can actually tap into that power. Because some of us, we want to tap into the power of God, but we're not even connected to Him. We're not even seeking Him. We're not even praying, right? So you're, it's not like you just recite verse 10 and then you're good. You have to actually have faith, and we're going to see that in the full armor of God. But God has vast reservoirs of might, and it can be realized as strength or power in our Christian life. But what happens if we sit passively? We're never going to experience the fullness of his strength. So there's two wrong ways to approach this. And think of this. Say, think if this has been you at times. So the first one is, some people rely on God's might, but they don't work. Right? Have you seen that? There's some people who are like, oh, just have faith, just do this. But they don't actually step out in faith. They don't actually do the work, so they get no results, right? But there's also a second part to this. There's people who do a lot of work. They do a lot of things, but they end up being tired, and they end up being worn out because they're not relying on the strength of God, right? So what's the key? I wrote the key up here. The key is for you to rely on God's might 
and then step out in faith to do the work. Amen? So it's a two-part thing. You can't, yeah, God's done everything for us, but we still need to step out in faith. Amen? So both of those things fall short, but that's the key up there. So some of you guys have received might from God, but maybe it's leaked away. So if you think of like a bucket or something with holes in it and you're trying to hold water, it's leaking away. There's a list of things that Martin Lloyd-Jones um, gave us, and I brought them here for you guys today. <laughs> but there's these things that might be sapping our strength as a Christian. Have you ever felt like you just felt just drained of the strength of God? Yeah, at times? And here's a list of things. I want you guys to think of this in your life. And if, if some of these things are you, Write these things down so that you can take them to the Lord. Amen? So committing too many spiritual works or things. So just doing works, just to do works, right? That can sap your strength. Too much conversation. Right? Elvis said, a little less conversation. No, I'm just kidding. But too much conversation. A lot of us talk too much. And we don't really think before we talk. We don't really allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. And it just saps our strength. Arguments, debates, wrangling, right? Maybe even twisting scripture to fit your view. Laziness. No one's lazy in this society, are there? <laughs> Laziness. And I was like, laziness, how does that sap strength? But your strength in Christ. And how many of you guys have been in bed all day and you just feel tired and you feel even worse, right? <laughs> and maybe you guys don't want to raise your hand. But you just feel worse, right? So too much time in the wrong company, he says. So I'm thinking maybe God's called you to be somewhere else. But maybe, no, it's like, oh, I want this career, though. Maybe you're wasting time and it's taking your energy. Too much foolish, foolish talk or joking. Love of money and career. A desire for respectability and image. So, you know, your ego, how people see you. You just want respect. You just, and what does that lead to? Fear of man, Right? An unequal yoking with an unbeliever. That could really take out your strength, right? You think of two oxen, they're yoked together. If one's pulling this way, one's pulling that way, it's gonna, you're not going to get a lot done, and you're just going to be fighting against another person, and it's just going to suck all your strength. Ungodly entertainment. I don't even know how much godly entertainment there is nowadays, right? And this last one, a wrong attitude toward or doubting the word of God. So he continued to say, he said, we have to walk on a knife edge in these matters. You must not become extreme on one side or the other, but you have to be watchful. So be watchful, amen? And of course, you can always tell how to, by examining yourself, whether your strength is increasing or decreasing. So think about that in your life. Is your strength in the Lord increasing or is it decreasing? If it's decreasing, maybe there's one of these things that was listed that is sapping your strength. So we need to work out our salvation with what? What does the Bible say? Fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12. And, you know, Satan, he's ruthless. He doesn't care. You know, he, he wants to take you from one extreme to the other. Like I said, I think last week or not last week, but last time I spoke, that Satan doesn't care what side of the boat he throws you out of, right? He just wants you soaking wet. So let's look at verse 11 now. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And like I said, we're going to examine that in future messages, but right now, let's just focus on the fact that God gives us, as believers, a full set of equipment that we can use for battle. Amen? Amen? And you guys probably know it. You guys probably have memorized it. But 
you guys have to, it's, it's, not, it's one thing to memorize it, but it's not just a mantra that you just say. You have to live it, amen? amen. <laughs> I'm glad God doesn't send us out naked, right? <laughs> he gives us everything we need. Second Peter 1.3 says, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And sometimes we don't believe that because we're trying to do things in our own strength and we feel like we can't live a godly life in this world. But God and God's word says that we can. Amen. He's given us all the tools. So don't be discouraged and take heart because his word is true. And you've heard it said that this life is not a playground, right? This life is a battleground. And that means that if this life is a battleground, we have to be on guard at all times. And I think the reason so many people in the church are weak is because they're not armed. They're not ready for battle. They're sitting down, right? If you're in, if you're in the army, are you sitting down to fight? No, you're standing. Amen? And I like John Corson's visual. He said, if the men who stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day did so dressed in their jammies, so he calls them jammies, I don't know if you guys do that, but he says something would have been terribly wrong. Yet I believe we live in the day of jammy Christianity. <laughs> he says, let's put on our jammies and talk about how we feel. We say, let's have a slumber party and we'll all bond. <laughs> No, Paul tells us to put on our armor to take advantage of the equipment God has given us to navigate this life and to negotiate the war around us. He says, Dear Saint, you can stand against the wiles of the devil, the cunning, clever attacks of Satan, only to the degree that you're protected with the whole armor of God. So you can't do it in your jammies. <laughs> you can't do it just in your normal clothes, you need to put on the full armor of Christ. So, how many of you guys can admit that you, it's, sometimes you forget that we're in a spiritual war? Does that ever happen to you? That happens to me all the time. So we, we try to sing this song, there's a song, this is a spiritual war, to remind us, right? But maybe you don't know how to take up the whole armor of God. Maybe you don't know how to stand and sadly, there's, already, there's people who don't believe in the devil at all. There's people who just think, I don't know what they think. They just think there's no devil at all. But I don't know how they say that, especially if you're a Christian, because the Bible clearly says that. And so we have many misconceptions, even in Christianity, many misconceptions about Satan and his demons. And even well-known pastors say that demons can't oppress you or anything like that. But you see these pastors, and what do they do? What do they encourage? They encourage just taking drugs for it, prescription drugs, or just putting labels on people, saying that it's just a behavioral issue. And I understand that sometimes that's true. You know, it can be chemical and things. But I think too much is dismissed by saying it's just a disorder or a chemical imbalance, right? And many people don't even mention hell in their messages, but Jesus taught more about that than any other person in the Bible. And I see it this way. It's like the church is being attacked, but then pastors or Christians are saying, oh, you know, there's no enemy, don't worry. But that's very dangerous. You guys can see how that's dangerous in the natural realm, right? If we said there's no such thing as terrorists, and we just, you know, didn't, didn't guard anything, you know, if there was no TSA or whatever. <laughs> Some, we wish that would happen for us. But for terrorists, then people would just be coming into this country and would take us out, right? So we need to understand that there's an enemy. And I was just listening to a guy the other day, um, and he was saying, oh, the gifts aren't for today. But when I hear that, it just sounds like they're saying, oh, the Bible's outdated. You can't do anything to stop the enemy. You have no power. You can't, you can't heal. You can't cast out demons. But the Bible says that in Matthew, right? The Bible says these things. So why wouldn't it be true for today? If we're, if we're supposed to live like the Acts Church, 
then what, how come that's all, how come they ignore all that, all the things done in the Acts church? We're supposed to be a continuation of that. Amen? So, <clears throat> God has given us power through His Word. What do we call it in the armor of God? What's His Word called? Sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And He's given us the full armor so that we don't have to just sit and let the enemy torment us anymore. And think about how glorified the devil is when people believe that there's no devil. That's what he wants. Because that's stealing glory from God. And that's giving glory to him. He doesn't care. He wants you to believe that he's not real. So that he could do more to you, right? This is why Paul says, take up the full armor so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And we need to tap into that power of God. We need to not just... Say, yeah, we have strength in God, but do nothing. We have to actually step out in faith. And what do we have? The shield of faith. Amen. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and, bl sorry, and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic, cosmic powers over this present darkness. That's a good book, by the way, This Present Darkness. <laughs> against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So here we see that Paul isn't calling us to enter spiritual warfare. Why? We were already born into it, right? We were, you know, it's, it's hard. Like, sometimes I'm like, man, I don't, I want to have kids, but I don't want to bring them into this world. <laughs> but it, it's hard. We, we come into this war but it's not hopeless for us. God's get, we have so much strength, but the, the problem is that we don't realize it most of the time. We don't understand that. So, and, and remember, look at this verse. Look at verse 12. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities. So we're not fighting it against each other. The enemy loves to make us think that way, right? The enemy loves to... Get us divided and just fighting against one another. But really, those are just tools that the enemy uses. Really, Satan's behind that. He's the one stirring, up, stirring that up. And we need to be aware of that so that we don't tear each other up. Amen? So, you're in a spiritual battle. And if you're ignorant of this, or if you just choose to ignore this fact, you're probably losing the battle already. But if you're battling against, yeah, if you're battling against that flesh and blood, if you're putting all your efforts against humans, or maybe even against the government, or whatever, even, even just like societies or something, if you're putting your efforts against that, then you're probably losing the war already. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4, 3-4, through four, three through four, sorry. It says, For though we walk in the flesh... We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Amen? Amen. And we're going to look at the next uh, verse, verse 5 later. But there's an unseen world, and there's a variety of enemies, right? We see rulers, all, we see all these different things. But we're, we don't need to go into that right now, because I'm going to save you guys a little time. But... You know, there's rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces, and we can, we can look at all those things, but really, you just need to know that they have one goal. What's their goal? To knock you out of the race, right? Their goal is to take you, I, I think I wrote it up here, their goal is take you from your standing with Christ, to knock you out of place. They don't want, you know... I think, the, well, Satan knows the Bible probably better than most of us. So, you know, it sounds crazy. It's like, Satan, haven't you read the ending? You're going to lose. But he's still fighting. He doesn't care, right? And so we need to make sure that we are standing strong because he wants to pull us down. And he wants to take everyone he can with him. So I want to read... Uh, or just mention these verses 
showing what the Bible says about these principalities and about these powers. Romans 8.38, you know Romans 8 where it's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God, but it also says principalities and powers cannot keep us from God's love. Amen? And this means that their power is limited. Ephesians 1, 20 through 21 reminds us that Jesus is enthroned where? In heaven, high above, far above all these principalities and powers. And Colossians talks a lot about this. Look, Colossians 1, 16 says that Jesus was the one who created these principalities and powers. So the creator is stronger than the creation. Amen? Amen. Colossians 2, 10 that reminds us that Jesus is head over all principalities and powers. So many people, you know, there's, there's people who believe that Satan is kind of equal in power to God. That is not true at all. Amen? God's not just like the brother of Satan. Like I believe, I think Mormons believe that. But God is up here and Satan's way down here, right? But the enemy lies to us. The enemy tries to make us think that he's so much powerful than he really is. So 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says that principalities and powers have an end. How many of you guys are excited for that end? Amen? And one day their purpose is going to be fulfilled. So you see that God's in control, that he's going to one day say no more. You know, but right now he's using them for a purpose. So we need to just allow God to do his work and obey his word by putting on the full armor of God and taking our stand against the enemy. Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus, Jesus has disarmed principalities and powers at the cross. Amen? And sometimes you're like, what? He's disarmed them? I still feel pretty attacked. And on this earth, you're going to feel attacked. And there's going to be attacks. And that's why we're learning how to deal with those attacks. But ultimately, we have victory in Christ. We, we, we fight these battles, and we're supposed to. But ultimately, God's already won the war. And that's great. You know, how many of you guys have ever played in a game or something, and you know you're going to lose? <laughs> but if you, if you don't, you know, it makes you not want to keep fighting anymore. It's like, why don't we just quit already? But then if you're like, oh, there's hope. If you know that there's hope, or there's, you, you, you're just like a couple, like a touchdown away or something, then you can fight even harder. But you're still supposed to fight in games, I'm saying. <laughs> because there would be kids who would like be running after the running back, and then they just give up. I'm like, what if the guy trips or something? I've seen it happen, and you could tackle them. But that's a different story. So... <laughs> Let's look at what the proper response to this spiritual warfare is. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I kind of feel like I'm repeating myself, right? <laughs> because Paul is repeating this. He's repeating, take up the whole armor of God. You see that he says, stand, stand. And as we start our, our other message, I think the next verse says to stand again. Right? So we need that repetition because we so easily forget. It's so easy to just accept the lies of the enemy, but we're not supposed to. And we already see that he mentioned take up the whole armor of God in verse 11. But here he's simply stating what the main purpose of spiritual warfare is. And so, without the strength of God, without the protection of the body armor, it's impossible to stand against the attacks of the enemy. If we're going at it in our own strength, in our jammies, <laughs> then we're not going to get far at all. We're going to get run over. But God has given you a call. He's given you a purpose. He's given you a mission. And, you know, he's given you a course to fulfill. But you can't fulfill it on your own strength. But he's provided you with everything you need to fulfill that. So Satan, 
or it was interesting because it, uh, they were looking at the Greek and everything, and this guy was calling it the Satan because really, Satan is what he's the adversary, right? He's just he's just against everything. He he just wants to tear everything up. He doesn't care. You know, he's against God, but he's against everything because God's creation, right? He just wants to mess everything up and do anything he can to take us with him. <clears throat> but he is doing his best to stop our mission. And when he attacks and when he intimidates you, what are you to do? Stand. Amen? You must stand. And the truth is that we have a glorious standing in Christ. And that's why he's so jealous. That's why he's so angry that God has given us all these things. And, the, and here, I'm going to read these truths um, that we find in his word about our standing. Romans 5.2. I listed them up here. Grace. We stand in grace, right? 1 Corinthians 15.1. We stand in the gospel. The word of God. The, you know, the truth is that we have salvation in him and that we have eternal life in him. But the devil doesn't want us to believe that. 1 Corinthians 6.13, we stand in courage and strength. 2 Corinthians 1.24, we stand in faith. Galatians 5.1, we stand in Christian liberty, in that freedom. And I encourage you guys to look up these verses because it's really encouraging when you read what you know, the teacher is saying. You read and you see that it's actually in the word of God. It's not just made up, right? Amen. Philippians 1.27, we stand in Christian unity. Philippians 1, I mean 4.1, we stand in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And then the last one, Colossians 4.12, we, sh we should, this is what we should do, but sometimes we don't do it because we're believing the lies of the enemy. But we should stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Amen. So there's a lot indicated by that one word stand, right? And there's a lot more because what does stand mean? That means that we're going to be attacked, right? Standing means that we're not supposed to be frightened. What do people do when they're scared? They usually run, right? But we're supposed to not be frightened by the enemy. That means that when you're standing, you're not supposed to just droop or slouch, right? You're supposed to have that confidence in God. You're not supposed to be uncertain. You're not supposed to be half-hearted or anything like that. Or how many of you guys have seen people who just wallow in self-pity? You know, they're like, oh, it's just so hard. This Christian walk is so hard. There's no self-pity allowed when God calls you to stand. <clears throat> and it also means that we need to be in our positions, right? In our positions to fight. In our positions alert and ready. And it also means that we're not to give even a thought to what? To retreat. We're not even supposed to think about running. If you think about the full armor of God, there's nothing covering the back, is there? Have you guys thought of that? We're not supposed to run. We're supposed to fight, right? And he's given us all these things to defend ourselves, but he's also given us the sword of the spirit for when we're supposed to attack. Amen? <clears throat> so where am I? <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Well, you, so before I go to that verse, the enemy, he loves to use confusion. He loves to use trickery because he doesn't want to be suspected. He wants to hide in the shadows because why? He does not want to be exposed. He doesn't want to be confronted, but we have the light of Christ in us, and we can confront him. Amen? And he's active and purposeful, you know. And it's true, he can inflict harm, you see, with Job and different things, but he's still limited, right? And then he can influence our thoughts, our minds, he can deceive us and tempt us. But I'm not saying this to scare you. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not here to scare you guys. And, you know, if you're walking in sin, yeah, I'd be scared. But I don't want you to walk in fear. I want you guys to realize that you have defenses available. 
you have the whole armor of God available. James 4, 7, this is the verse I was talking about. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? Amen. But you see, a lot of people aren't submitted to God. So the enemy is able to get a foothold in their life. The enemy is able to oppress them, right? And so we need to make sure that we are submitted to God, not in just a few areas, but every area. And, every, and if you give a foothold to the enemy, you need to confess and renounce it, turn to God so that he can fill that, fill that spot, right, and throw off the enemy. <clears throat> And pride, pride is a big one. Pride, if you look at most of your sin, is rooted in pride usually. And there's no pride, you should not have any pride. You're not supposed to have pride over the enemy. Like, hey, you know, I, I got all this power. That's not how you do it. Look at Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, <clears throat> do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So there's no place for pride in exercising your spiritual authority in Christ. But we do need to stand against the enemy and boast in who? Boast in Christ. Amen. So the Church of America, I believe, is weak because we believe the lie that the gifts aren't for today. You know, we believed 1 Corinthians 12. I mean... We haven't believed that. We haven't believed that those gifts are available. And what happens? The church becomes overcome. Overcome, sorry. Because they believe that lie. They believe that it's impossible for the Christian to be oppressed. And many use 1 John 5.18. Maybe you've heard people say this to you. They say, <clears throat> We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And I think I heard Kevin saying this last night, that reverse it, right? What if you are sinning? What if you are living in sin? Then are you going to have that protection? Are you going, the enemy is going to be able to have a foothold, right? So we need to make sure that we're not keeping a practice of sinning. Because that's what gives the devil a mighty foothold. So if you're hiding sin right now, I'm speaking to you if you're doing that. If you're hiding sin or if you're blatantly going and sinning, you need to confess it. You need to renounce it today. Like James 4, 7, submit to God and the devil will flee. Amen. <clears throat> so the, I think the reason many people aren't freed from the demonic is because they've given that right to the enemy. But what happens? If you break the right, you can allow, you can expel the enemy, right? But many people refuse to break the right. They choose to hold on to that sin. It's like they're freed from all these sins, but they just choose to hold that on to that one sin. And that's where the enemy remains. And if you don't get rid of that, he'll remain as long as he wants. And he wants to remain forever, right? So we got, you know, here we pray against the demonic and we pray for deliverance. You know, Matthew 10, 8 says to cast out demons, right? But we can't override your will. It's not like we're just going to cast out a demon or, or maybe not like possession, but maybe there's just a demon just sitting there just waiting to encourage you to do something because you've given that foothold but if you like that, if that's your friend, if that's not your enemy, then we can't free you of that. Even if we do, then there's gonna, everything's going to be wiped clean and then seven stronger spirits will come in, right? And just come around and hang around you. So you need to hate your sin. But the devil, how does he keep us in bondage? Through lies. Lies. And then what does he do? He makes you repeat them until you believe them. So when you find yourself battling those thoughts of doubt, despair, discouragement, or just anything negative, that's a perfect time for you to take your stand. Amen? 
And that's when you pull out what? Sword of the Spirit. And you proclaim the truth of God's word. 1 John 4, 4. Use this one. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. 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 And you need to believe that. You need to believe that Je whoa, Jesus is in you. And that he is bigger than the lying devil. Amen. And you can't tolerate the enemy's lies. You know, many of us tolerate it. We think, oh, that might be kind of true, though. And then we get insecure, and that's how the enemy just rips us apart. Don't tolerate the enemy's lies. Amen. Believe. What do, we, what do we always sing as kids? Jesus loves me, this I know, right? He died for us. He covered all your sin. There's nothing too big. You haven't fallen too far or anything. Jesus' death on the cross has covered it all. And the devil is what? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And you can't, you know, you can't keep letting him win in your life by telling, allowing him to tell you those lies. So, Amen. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I love that verse because we have so many thoughts coming in our head. Sometimes we're like, where did these thoughts come from, right? They're, sometimes they're just random. But this testing and this control of thoughts is critical in spiritual warfare. <clears throat> and it's essential if we want to live a victorious Christian life. So I want you, I don't want you to be in fear of the enemy. That's not what this message is about. I just want you to be more aware of the enemy, more aware of the spiritual realm and learn how to war. You know, we pray for those warring angels to war with us, but we need to be warring. And uh, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, or you don't have to correct me right here. I'm just kidding. But I think it is in Daniel, when Daniel was praying and fasting, I think there was an angel, you know, coming to help him, but he got caught up with the, principality or something of Persia or something like that. I hope, hopefully I'm saying it right. <laughs> but, you know, and then I think he said Michael had to free him. So you guys got to realize that you got to pray because, you know, there's, there's spiritual battles. I, I think we always think that, oh no, God's got it. We don't have to pray or anything. But we really do. We really need to war against the enemy. <clears throat> So, again, if you are in blatant sin, you should be fearful <laughs> because that's where the enemy wants you. He's already got you. He's, he's made you vulnerable, but it's not like you're stuck there. You can choose to confess and renounce that sin and walk in the freedom of Christ. So, again, let Jesus be the Lord of your life. 1 John 4, 4, I want to read it again. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So I want to test you. Should you fear the enemy? No. no. But don't get cocky either, right? You're not supposed to be prideful or cocky. But the enemy has no special power over you except that which you give him. <clears throat> Just whatever you permit him to hang on to through your sin, he's got you there. But you don't have to give him that power. And it seems like the enemy's favorite tactic, again, is just those lies. But you need to be stubborn against the enemy, right? We can be stubborn towards people. Why, not? We, why can't we be stubborn towards the enemy, right? Against the evil. It's okay to be stubborn against evil. And that's why chapter 6 continues to say what? Stand. Amen? <clears throat> How many of you guys know Corey Ten Boom? Yeah. She wisely noted that the fear of demons is from demons themselves, yeah. right? And, and we, add, we add to that fear all the time. You know, I was just thinking about, I was just thinking how if the devil gets a lie in your head, how powerful it can be because we just continue to add to it. I was just thinking about um, blood pressure. When I take my blood pressure, like in high school, they would say, 
Oh, it's, it's, getting, it's a little high. It's like in the 130s or something. Um, and it's, and it's supposed to be like 120. And so every time I go into the doctor's office, I start thinking about my blood pressure. And I'm like, oh, man. And so my blood pressure raises, right? It's, it's weird. My heart rate is still low, but my bre- blood pressure raises. And so that's the power of your thoughts. And so we need to not believe what the enemy tells us. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Matthew six thirteen, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's in the Lord's Prayer, right? And it's important. Why would Jesus tell us to specifically pray for protection from the evil one if it wasn't his desire to give us that protection? Right? God wants us to pray that. And you see, demons, like I said, they have some power, but Jesus says that we can limit them through our prayers. Amen? <clears throat> and what does the devil come to do? Steal, kill, and what? Destroy. John 10.10. 10. So that means no matter how holy or godly you are, the devil's still going to come after you. Did the devil come after Jesus? Yeah? He was pretty... Perfect, right? And then what about the apostles? You know, so the devil's not going to say, oh, they're out of reach. They're too holy. I'll never be able to make them fall. He wants to get you one way or the other. You know, maybe you're, you hardly sin. The devil wants to get you through pride, right? So you need to be aware of the enemy's schemes and be aware of his lies so that you don't believe them. That's why we are to stand and to stand and to what? Stand again. Amen? Never drop your guard because the devil walks around like a prowling lion, right? He's just waiting for those who he's ready to devour. First Peter 5, eight. So instead, I just want, we must believe in and obey the scripture for today. So I just want to read that once again, lock it in, and then we'll pray. So Ephesians 6. 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. <clears throat> Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. In the heavenly places. Verse 13. <clears throat> Therefore take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father. <laughs> we thank you that you have provided. You've given us life. But you've also shown us how to live this life, God. And you tell us that we don't have to be overcome by the evil one. Instead, you tell us to stand, to stand firm, not to run, not to hide, but to have the light of Christ and to have that boldness because of you, God, because you're in us. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us um, the gifts. You've given us the armor of God. And I just thank you, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you that the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is the truth that just cuts those lies apart. It just pierces them and causes them to go away. I thank you, Father, for your truth. I pray that we would be in your truth daily, that we would be studying it, that we would, it would just be a part of us, God. We don't want to... um, twist scripture we don't want to just believe what the world tells us but we believe what you say and you say that you've given us all authority over the enemy and so i pray father that we would walk in that today that we won't you know if there's places in our lives where we are holding on to that sin i pray that we could give that up to you today we lay that at your feet that we get rid of it that we would no longer wanted that we would no longer rely on that sin but that instead we would rely on you and i pray that you'll show us the balance god we we realize that you've done everything but we still want to step out in faith 
we realize that you have all power, but we still need to walk in it, God. We still need to let your strength be actualized in our life. And so I pray, God, that we would understand, understand that more and more every day. And thank you for your love that makes all this possible, God, because you're the one who died on the cross for our sins because of that love. And you're the one who rose again. You conquered over sin and death. You conquered over the enemy. And you've given us victory. So we praise you, God, and we're excited for this life that you've given us. No matter how, how hard it is, we know that we have victory in you. And so we praise you, and we give this all to you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be.